And now we are then switching to our second part uh, for today. So uh, we have started for being a bit on the on the broader scope on the on the COVID impact in in general in the on the AMR field. And now we are diving more into the innovation R&D part uh, where the academics are sitting and trying uh, to work and also to, to set up uh, uh, consortia with with, um, with academics, with research institutes, maybe also with pharma industry. And I I say a very warm welcome to Jessica. So she's the, the moderator of this next session. She's here um, from the Medical Research Council UK, but also representing the JPI AMR uh, consortium. So I will leave it to her to explain more of what they are doing. And uh, it's also great stuff coming up from, from there. And yeah, so I hand over to you in the next session and looking forward to further discussions today. Thanks very much, Sandra. And uh, thank you very much to Deb and uh, also the others, Janet and David and Justin, for a very, very interesting session. I, I was able to listen. So, so now we're sort of looking from the academic perspective at what the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic have been and how that might have brought some innovation to AMR research. Um, as uh, Sandra alluded to, I'm representing the JPI AMR here in this, this session. And, and really we found, I'm, I'm going to do a short introduction about the JPI AMR stuff before I introduce the others, but we've found that uh, as others noted in the previous session, the attention brought to infectious disease uh, outbreaks, very devastating outbreaks, has been a, a mixed blessing for AMR. So, so in terms of how we've delivered our activities, we haven't paused. So we've still been able to run our calls. We've still been able to, to run the research calls. We haven't been able to do the face-to-face -face workshops and meetings that we normally would have done through the JPI AMR. And, and it's been a learning process over the last year, actually. So the first couple of webinars that we delivered were uh, focused a little bit more on um, understanding how the COVID-19 outbreak had impacted the use of antibiotics, for example. So we had a live webinar about how, you know, have, have antibiotics been used appropriately. And that was in June. And we had a second webinar in June asking the community and, and trying to, to ascertain how to facilitate AMR research during the pandemic. And then we had a third webinar which was more about how do we simultaneously manage the acute COVID-19 pandemic and the escalating use of, uh, or the escalation in antibiotic resistance. So, so that, that somebody alluded in the previous session to the slow pandemic of AMR versus the acute pandemic of COVID-19. So those were webinars that was, that was new for the JPI AMR in terms of what we delivered. Um, we were also able to deliver some workshops. So the first one that we did, which we would have delivered anyway as a face-to-face -face meeting and had been planned as a face-to-face -face meeting was looking at the outcomes from research that, that we'd funded on interventions to reduce the development and transmission of AMR. And for that, we, we were able to see all the outcomes and, and communicate results between the different projects who participated but it allowed us to invite the wider research grouping. So instead of just being able to invite the PI of these transnational projects, we were actually able to involve all of the academics involved. And indeed, we encouraged the participation of early career researchers, some of the postdocs. And that actually led to a second workshop that we ran last April, which was virtual. And there we really came out of our comfort zone because we went beyond our JPI AMR research community and we ran a workshop on AMR therapeutics, which was really interesting. We had, we had strong global participation. We had strong participation from many different groups across the AMR landscape. And I, I hope that others who participated felt that it was a useful endeavor. We've, we've, uh, we've put those, the recordings of those workshop events onto the JPI AMR website where people can um, have access to them if they want to look at the discussions. So they were a mixture of research outcomes, but also what's needed in the field, what's the landscape of AMR therapeutics and, and how can we um, identify the gaps and maybe um, 
think about challenges. And actually out of the, on the backdrop of that particular workshop, we've been de developing a workshop, uh, a, a network call, not a network call, a research call, sorry. So this is kind of the advertisement section of my uh, presentation. Please do look out for, um, in the AMR Antibiotic Awareness Week in November, we'll have an announcement about the next JPI AMR call. Our call is always launched in January. This one will be therapeutics. So, so please do have a look at, at that. So, so in terms of business as usual for the JPI AMR, we've been able to conduct our business just in a different way. We hope we've been actually able to communicate outcomes more widely than we've done in the past. And indeed, we've now got a, a digital um, platform which is available to access to access on from the JPI AMR website, which is another tool for academics and indeed industry members to see what research is coming through, what's been funded in the global research um, program in AMR. So that's my sort of advertisement for the JPI AMR. And I'd like to invite Christoph, please, to introduce yourself and, and you know, take five minutes to talk about what you guys do in your institute and, and um, what you would like to see out of this discussion, please. Great. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate having a chance to present NCCR antivirus. So maybe I'll start with myself. My name is <coughs> Christoph de Hill. I'm a professor for molecular microbiology at Biozentrum, University of Basel. And though the NCCR antivirus, or the National Center of Competence in Research, is a Swiss wide research uh, network which is centered in Basel, it's funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation and the University of Basel as a leading house with about 30 million. Uh, US dollar for the first four years, and it will be funded for two subsequent phases with equal effort. So, so all in all, 12 years. So it's a major um, undertaking, and we started about a year ago in, in August 2020. So let me briefly walk you through what, what we intend to do in NCCR. So our mission is to overcome the antibiotic resistance crisis by revitalizing antibiotic discovery. So what is our approach? So we like to bring a patient-centered paradigm shift uh, in antibiotic discovery. So essentially, we like to improve the assays which are currently used for antibiotic discovery. So for the moment, it's still a, a very unphysiological approach using rich media, like with a hinton prosp. And what we like to do is to shift this towards a patient-centered a patient -centered approach. And we think that this will give huge opportunities for the discovery of, of new antibiotics and, and also non-canonical strategies. And so the roadmap we have um, for this project is to progress from clinical and basic research to technology development. And we essentially start off with clinical studies. We have uh, several indications to look for pneumonia, your lung infections, deep-seated infections, skin infections, UTI. Uh, for a couple of, of uh, focus pathogens, which are E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Staph aureus. And we like to learn from this clinical studies the physiological state of the bacteria. And then use this information in order to inform the development of models, experimental models, which can be picked up after bioengineering. And we bring them, and we parallelize them, and then miniaturize them, which can be picked up by pharmaceutical companies for mass screening approaches. So essentially, we like to understand the state of the bacteria in the host translates this into better models. And this can be very simple axonic models with improved media, or can also be very complex um, microphysiological models like 3D organoid models. And so this is the main uh, activities for the first four years. And then we move gradually into more transnational activities in cooperation with pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies, and then back to clinical activities. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Christoph. Jürgen, can I do the same? Um, I'd like to introduce Jürgen Popp, and he's the chair for physical chemistry at the Friedrichs Scheller University, and oh, I can't even say it, Jena, and scientific director of Leibniz Institute of Photronic Technology in Jena in Germany. So please, um, can you give us a little bit of background about what your group does, please? Yeah, many thanks, uh, Jessica. And um, yeah, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce to you a little bit not our institute, but uh, our research campus called Infect Diagnostics. It's a, pr a public private partnership 
which we established uh, in Jena and we started with the phase one in 2015 to 2020. So we have government funding uh, over five years in total, something like, uh, because it's a public-private partnership, something like uh, 50 to uh, 80 million euros has been invested. What have we done in the first phase? First of all, we have est uh, established a common infrastructure and we have started transnational collaborative, uh, collaborative research projects on diagnostic, on infection diseases and AMR detection. And we have built up uh, a strong network between academic, uh, academic research industry and uh, the medical research. And now we are in the funding phase two, which is so-called the expansion phase. And um, since we have developed uh, some great techniques, which allows, for example, based on uh, optics and photonics, uh, a faster, let's say, uh, access to uh, IMR, we'd like to develop this technique further. We want to um, develop this uh, towards the market. And um, we have also uh, developed here some, some, let's say, technology platforms for the detection of infection diseases, but also uh, on the host response. And um, those techniques like we'd like now to move further to the market and um, not just to the human, uh, let's say to the health market of humans, but also um, to new markets, for example, to um, the animal market, but also using this technology in the environmental uh, area, because here AMR is a, a problem um, as well as, uh, for example, in humans. And uh, therefore, we'd like to expand this uh, step by step. And um, yeah, we have been also successful in getting um, now from um, from the research government a quite huge grant, um, which um, allows us to develop, a, let's say, something like a translational infrastructure. It's called the Leibniz Center for Photonic in Infection Research, and this is an infrastructure which um, um, get funding, uh, which is worth something like 120 to 130 million euros. Can you still hear me? Yeah. There was something yeah. um, coming in. I don't know. So um, um, I was talking about uh, a really fantastic infrastructure we can build uh, here in Jena. And this is for the translation of uh, new uh, uh, diagnostic techniques for AMR as well as for new therapeutics, uh, especially for, uh, let's say, uh, patients uh, which are uh, very difficult to be treated uh, with the common uh, treatments. And um, this specific infrastructure uh, has the goal, it's a user open infrastructure, uh, to build more or less um, the basis that the translation of new MMR techniques or techniques for the diagnostics of infection uh, in a much faster way. So normally we need something like 15, 20 years to get a medical product to the market. Uh, we want to really accelerate this entire process by a very structured modular uh, system. And uh, we are now at the moment to build up this, um, this um, uh, infrastructure. So, so to say, Based on the research campus in diagnostics, we are now moving to develop here a new type of infrastructure for the translation uh, of um, new diagnostic tools as well as therapeutic tools. And as I said, this will be at the very end a um, uh, user open infrastructure uh, where industry but also academia can apply for and then we try to translate those findings from the prototype towards uh, or from the uh, let's say proof of concept to a prototype and finally to a product and this on under iso conform conditions so that at the very end there can be a medical product being developed so this is somehow a quick summary of what we have been doing and i think what is quite important this is not a purely academic research it's a public private partnership where we work close together with industry as well as with medical people and uh, the basis is on new photonics uh, technologies together with uh, molecular technologies and uh, for the infect diagnostics research campus one of the most important issues is on diagnostics and here uh, amr is one of the hot topics
That's super. Thank you very much, Jürgen. It sounds a bit like the ICON consortium that Janet Hemingway was talking about that was set up in Liverpool, the public-private partnership. So very interested to, to hear more about that during our discussion. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Philippe villain Guillaume, CEO and co-founder of Noza Farm in France. Philippe? Yes, introduce it, yeah. So um, um, hello to, uh, to everybody. So I am uh, Philippe Villandio. I am the CEO and co-founder of Nozo Farm. Nozo Farm is a biotech company uh, specialized in the uh, discovery and uh, drug development of uh, new antimicrobials. Uh, for this purpose, we, we have developed uh, an innovative uh, drug discovery platform based on the, uh, the, the therapeutic exploitation of uh, underexplored bacteria called Photorabdus and, uh, and Xenorabdus. And uh, with this platform, we uh, we built a pipeline of new classes of uh, antibiotics. The most advanced one is uh, is called the odilorabdins, and its first uh, clinical candidate, uh, Nozo 502, should enter uh, clinical trials uh, and first in human uh, first in human clinical trials uh, next year. Uh, we incorporated uh, more than 10 years ago now. Uh, we are based in Lyon and Nîmes uh, in France. And so, so far we have uh, raised about uh, uh, 16 million euros in uh, private and public uh, funding. Uh, we are also part of uh, uh, IMI2 uh, uh, consortium called uh, uh, Gram Negative Antibacterials Now, now or GNA Now, uh, which is uh, led by uh, Lydia Chur and uh, Ivo Tech and which, uh, with a budget of uh, um, 30, uh, 30 million uh, euros. And its purpose is to uh, to develop in parallel uh, three new uh, antibacterial uh, molecules, uh, two uh, two are coming from Nozofarm and one coming from uh, from Evotech uh, so far, and the the consortium includes uh, about uh, uh, thirteen uh, partners from uh, all uh, all Europe. So uh, that's uh, what I can say shortly about uh, about Nozofarm and uh, mainly the GNNR uh, consortium. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. So um, we've we've been given a few questions to start the ball rolling, but anyone else who would like to pose questions for this panel discussion, please do so on the chat and I will try to bring your questions into the discussion. But the first one that we've been asking, Philippe, since you've got your, your mic unmuted, I'll ask Jürgen and Christoph to also unmute. Um, what has been the impact of, of COVID-19 on your ability to do business as usual, really. You know, how has that impacted the development of your antimicrobials? Yes, so uh, uh, at the beginning, since our main programs are uh, developed with uh, the European Consortium GNNO, what was difficult is, uh, of course, on the different uh, containment measures or lockdowns that were done uh, all, uh, all over Europe. Uh, since uh, it's uh, obvious, but our activities require uh, requires uh, lab activity and bench activity, and so uh, many uh, universities or uh, labs were uh, closed, or many uh, many uh, teams uh, were uh, uh, from our from our partners and were. Uh, uh, how to say how to uh, to prioritize uh, COVID nineteen activities for their uh, own hospitals for diagnostics or other uh, other uh, uh, clinical research, or whatever. So uh, the difficulty was the fact that uh, everything was stopped uh, in the lab, and we require a lot of uh, data since we are uh, for one program we went the um, uh, hit to lead activity. So we we do some uh, chemistry, we generate uh, dozens of uh, new compounds that needs to be. Uh, pharmacologically uh, characterized in uh, different institutes. So uh, this has to be managed, but uh, thanks to the, uh, the goodwill of everybody, uh, we uh, we did not get so uh, so many delays with respect to uh, to this, and the coordination was uh, was good. Uh, what was a bit uh, challenging, and uh, many now that, that we we face, uh, I think it's all over Europe, but in France, uh, for instance, we face some uh, some challenges to uh, to procure some. Uh, some uh, lab equipments, uh, plastics, microplates, uh, pipettes, pipette tips. Uh, uh, it uh, it begins to be a bit uh, a bit difficult. So we got to to adapt and to uh, to um, to slow down the the pace that, that we got to uh, to test uh, and uh, to or to assess uh, dozens of uh, of new new compounds. But uh, for this, it's a uh, uh, it was a bit. Fun. We we have to adapt to to this. Uh, the most challenging part was uh, the fact that our most advanced campaign is uh, uh, on track to to enter a clinical trials next year, 
uh, this uh, this was uh, supposed to be done uh, for this will be done by the medical university in Vienna in Austria uh, and uh, as for many uh, clinical trials uh, they uh, they face uh, challenges to uh, to or to say to uh, to have staff to have uh, doctors to have uh, to recruit patients to have uh, available beds so um, obviously that uh, everything was uh, was not puzzled, but uh, um, stalled with uh, the COVID crisis, of course, and uh, hopefully uh, th uh, they will be able to um, to to regain a normal activity next year, and we sh will be able to uh, to enter our uh, first human clinical trials uh, next year as planned. Uh, if not, we'll have to to get some delays. And for SMEs like Nozofarm. Uh, any time delays are very challenging because we. Um, what is really important for us is our burn rate, and um, we uh, time is really uh, a key, and we, we cannot afford too too much delays since it can uh, it can be uh, complicated with our in investor or our business development activities. For instance, uh, the business model of Nozo Farm is to uh, out license its uh, its antibacterials uh, at uh, the end of phase one. Uh, we, it will be our first uh, out licensing revenue with uh, our Nozo Five to compound, and we we need it uh, as fast as possible as we can this. And any delays we can we we have in the phase one uh, um, will um, say will uh, um, will um, imply some delays for uh, out licensing activities. So, so are you able to quantify the sort of um, delay factor? That, you know, how far back have you been put in terms of months, or is it is it the full time? Is it six months delay? Is it a year's delay? Yes, it is about uh, about uh, six months delay. Hmm. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you, Philippe. And and yeah, quite a challenge for any anyone, but an SME is very difficult. Jurgen, can I come to you? How has how has COVID-19 impacted on the research that you've been trying to deliver and indeed the setup of this public-private partnership? So the, the, I would say there, there were certain effects um, and also some, some delays uh, due to the fact that face-to-face uh, uh, -face meetings at the very beginning were very difficult. Luckily, we didn't have any problems with, uh, let's say, that our uh, laboratories have, had been shut down. Um, so at the university, but also at our research institute, um, the research was going on more or less as normal as possible. Certainly, we had to take uh, all this uh, or to, 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 to obey all these rules uh, in order to protect each other. But uh, since we are dealing always with, with pathogens, um, this wasn't uh, a big issue. So our research really continues and um, COVID had uh, a lot of impact by starting a new type of research, especially in the field of diagnostics. And uh, in the university hospital, we have access also to the uh, S3 labs so that we can directly work on the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus detection. And um, this started a lot of new research projects um, on, for example, the host response, as well as on uh, the virus detection, direct detection, or uh, even uh, or uh, RNA-based uh, RNA uh, detection. So new types of technology have been um, developed. So this was uh, somehow triggering uh, new, new, let's say, work. But uh, apart from these new initiatives, Certainly, the main focus also within the pandemic was to further increase the development of new photonic-based and molecular diagnostic approaches uh, for the resistant bacteria, but also for uh, other pathogens. And um, as I said, yeah, virus is now also getting more and more relevant to our work. And I think what was quite important that um, that we have already established this uh, research campus over five, six years, um, there was uh, a good uh, relationship already established between uh, the various partners and um, therefore for example we started also new topics like uh, using genome se sequencing and advanced genetics with new partners uh, with new companies being involved in our research campus and um, i think step by step this developed further so certainly uh, the pandemic was somehow a burden or is still a burden to everybody uh, but it also triggers uh, new ideas, uh, new initiatives. And um, for example, uh, also the, the topic of host response, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, is um, quite important for bacterial infection, but also for viral infection. 
And um, this also, um, for example, triggered then also new projects on, for example, the immune reaction or the uh, vaccination status. And um, this was more or less also correlated with the second funding period of the Infectognostic Research Campus. So we started also here new projects towards this direction. And um, I think, yeah, as I said, there is a certain burden, but also I think it was a quite a good chance to, to accelerate certain topics uh, within the field of infection diseases. Yeah, quite interesting. So, so a different kind of story that, that COVID-19 has actually um, allowed some innovation and, and allowed the research to flourish, which is, is a good message, but different from other people. Christoph, how has it affected the research? Um, the fundamental research into the bacteria and, and mechanisms of disease and things that your research institute looks at? So I have to say we have been impacted quite heavily by, by the pandemic, and actually on different levels. So we started in, in August 2020, and so this was after the first lockdown, and so recruitment was heavily impacted because a lot of new projects started and, and it was literally impossible to invite people from, from abroad as candidates. Um, of course, we had also restrictions in the lab. We never stopped completely um, lab work, but of course, it was highly diluted, uh, diluted out because of restrictions of how many people could work on, on how many square meters. So, uh, research was slowed down. Uh, but maybe most important for us is I mentioned that uh, clinical studies were extremely important for us, and particular sampling in the ICU, for instance, was for a longer period impossible for different reasons. First of all, I think the, the medical doctors were simply completely overwhelmed by the COVID pandemic. Uh, second, I think there were limitations that the ethical committees were no longer actually dealing with uh, bacteria uh, ethical uh, applications, but rather because it was all COVID research at the time. So I think all, all this was um, quite quite an impact, um, which was slowing down about the positive things. So, so for instance, uh, public part, uh, uh, Public-private partnerships we could develop um, well during this period. Um, we, uh, we could also have a much bigger outreach, for instance, for seminars, because uh, if you talk in, by Zoom, it's of course a bit difficult to, to shape a group. But you can, of course, broadcast this uh, in the whole world. And so we had much more people actually following on different places our seminars. So it has good sides. But for a consortium starting in this period, this uh, has been quite a difficult, I would say. Yeah, so so very challenging in, in recruiting new staff. We've had we've had a, a comment from the uh, wider participants about the brain drain. So Jurgen and Philip, Jurgen, because you're not muted now, did you find that there was a brain drain? Did people want to leave to perhaps go back home in the face of the pandemic? And has that um, impacted activity, or or have you not had an issue with that? I think brain drain wasn't a big issue, but uh, as already mentioned, it is a big issue really hiring new people. Yeah? Yeah. Because um, due to the pandemic, uh, we didn't have any access, uh, even for interviews, um, getting people to Germany yeah, from all over the world. And this is certainly uh, was a big issue because when you are starting uh, new research topics and you have uh, funding, and uh, but you can't uh, really hire people, uh, and then it's getting very, very difficult. And this certainly was um, uh, an issue. Brain drain that people want to go back, uh, not really. We had some uh, of our uh, PhD students or postdocs, when the pandemic was going down, for example, then they went back to India and they were more or less than stranded in India because there uh, was then the, the pandemic coming up and uh, therefore they were not allowed to go back to, to Germany that easily. And this was a big issue, uh, but otherwise, not uh, brain drain was not really something. And Philippe, what what about for um, for the therapeutics development? Did you find have you found it a difficult to recruit, but b have you lost staff members? Uh, we did not lose any uh, lose any uh, staff member. Um, we have a, a, a recurring uh, issue uh, with uh, not really with uh, um, early uh, early stage early stage researchers, but mainly with uh, expert uh, clinical developers with uh, industrial uh, experience, and that's uh, uh, it's a, a problem with uh, some uh, <laughs> some year long now because uh, uh, since uh, many pharma big pharma get out of the field of antibiotics. Uh, decades ago, 
uh, we have lost some uh, industrial expertise and it, it becomes harder, uh, especially in Europe, to, uh, to other hand harder to recruit uh, senior people with, uh, with expertise and experience in clinical development uh, for, uh, for the industry, I say, uh, not, uh, not with, uh, for academics. And this is really, uh, really challenging to, to find uh, people because uh, antibiotics have their, uh, uh, have their own uh, specificities. Just let's, uh, let's uh, mention the, uh, the, the amount of, uh, of drug you, you administer to patients uh, each day. Uh, We're talking about grants for some people. It's really uh, surprising compared to other uh, uh, therapeutic fields. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is one, key, uh, one key problem to us is how to, to hire uh, senior, uh, senior experts in the, in the field rather than uh, uh, early stage researchers. And all the, the key uh, behind that is uh, always the same as uh, the lack of interest of the big pharma and, and so on, the, the lack of interest of investors for, for the field due to this uh, uh, lack of interest from the big pharma. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very interesting. So um, going back to my sort of cheat sheet of questions from the from the workshop organizers, has the COVID-19 pandemic, um, will it fundamentally change the way that you conduct research in the future? So Christoph, I'll give you that one first. I think there has been a lot of lessons we have been all taking from this pandemic and uh, maybe it shows that things can go much faster if they have to. And uh, I think um, it also changed completely the awareness of, of the population towards uh, infectious disease and, and even so, it has been quite distracting uh, for us. Um, I mentioned the problems we had in setting up the consortium under these constraints. I think for the long run, it will be a big benefit um, because uh, I think the awareness of, of the problem of AMR is, is raising again. Uh, when I just look in, in the newspapers now in, in Switzerland, I think people realize that uh, the market needs to be repaired and we need to have incentives in order to get uh, the, the whole um, chain of, of from, from discovery to placing an antibiotic on the market um, worked out again. And so from that perspective, uh, I see a, a big incentive. Uh, maybe I can just advertise a little bit for tomorrow. We will have the launch of INCATE. So this is actually an initiative in order to bridge a gap uh, from early discovery to um, basically um, a stage where you can get eligible as, as a startup for CarbX funding, which for the moment has been really underfunded and, and has been very difficult and so this will be launched tomorrow afternoon uh, at, at 3 30 so for those which are interested and i think this is actually um the right moment now because uh, everybody feels uh, we'll hope uh, that the whole system somehow gets moving and i think now we have to be innovative now we really have to push in order to fill the pipeline from the bottom because all pull mechanisms won't help if you don't have enough uh, initial innovation and so for that reason, I think it's, it's a quite exciting period now um, from that perspective and or whether this actually has been triggered by COVID or not, I'm not sure, but maybe it has contributed to helping to, to get these things moving in, in the bigger picture. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully it will be a way for us to, it will be, the COVID-19 pandemic will be the, the initiative to to get things done faster. So, so as um, I think it was Jurgen pointed out, normally the timelines are 10 to 20 years to develop a new therapeutic or new anti uh, new diagnostic to bring to market. And hopefully um, we found other, better ways of working to streamline the process. Jurgen, um, anything that you think will be, well, I think, I think you explained that you have, a, have changed the ways in which you'll work a little bit, but are there any, is there anything else that you want to add to um, that, that sort of discussion about fundamental changes in the way you work? So I think what is quite important is to get a little bit more a holistic picture of, uh, let's say, infection diseases in general. Uh, so if you just focus on, on one topic, yeah, then it's somehow always we have a shortcoming. And I think this pandemic just explains us that the situation is more complex than uh, that you need a diagnostic tool or you need some therapeutics or you need uh, uh, something uh, in order to protect biohygienic rules in the society. I think uh, what is quite important to take this uh, movement, what we have at the moment, um, really to 
push forward to get a little bit more, let's say, uh, aware, further awareness that infection diseases related with all these topics are quite important. It's not just the end. When COVID is over, it's again at the starting point. Uh, we have been we're talking about this uh, slow pandemics yeah, like AMR. And I think we, we, this is now the appropriate time window that we really go forward uh, to this awareness and uh, we need to to have m new diagnostic tools and at least what we can learn from this COVID uh, pandemic is that uh, when people scientists worldwide uh, work closely together and um, also this open data open science is getting uh, more realistic then uh, we can push for new diagnostics we can push easily for new um, therapeutics and I think this is the benefit and this we have this let's say this motion we need to take in order to uh, develop now for AMR but all other uh, infection challenges we need to find and uh, develop new solutions and I think this is the lesson learned and this is also what we will establish here in Vienna in our research campus uh, in order to be more effective uh, towards the challenges of infection diseases. So, Philippe, do you want to weigh in on that? How how might your the ways of working change um, due to what you've learned from COVID? Yes, actually, our way of working didn't uh, change a lot because we were uh, already used uh, at Nozo Farm, and uh, I think that's the case for uh, for people here to do some collaborative research and uh, to uh, with uh, with people from different uh, different countries. So we were already used to online meetings, uh, but uh, clearly, what we are missing are uh, uh, since uh, these kinds of online meetings or the fact that we, we cannot meet face to face generate a lot of uh, misunderstandings or misalignment between the partners. And uh, for, for me, I'm a bit, uh, maybe I'm a bit old school, but the, the best way to, uh, to feel this or to clear this is to meet. And uh, actually doing a lot of online meetings was compensated to, uh, uh, by the fact that we got the opportunity many times to meet the partner once a year or twice a year or during the uh, the uh, different uh, congress uh, like Etmid or uh, or microbe uh, ASM microbe, when you can uh, you can see you can meet you can have a coffee and uh, that's the way you I would say you put um, uh, you make things uh, things smoother uh, within a, a consortium, and uh, we have to uh, the way we have to do it now is to be uh, to be uh, much more clearer during the meetings about what we uh, what we need. Uh, what is the result? What are the, uh, the um, how to align the interests huh, that are always different between a, a big pharma who can be a member of um, a consortium, uh, uh, mainly with the IMI, uh, with a uh, SME like Nozo Farm, with uh, with academics, and uh, that's not that's not that easy. And uh, I think we need new new ways to, to work in this, um, in this. But hopefully. Uh, this crisis will end, and uh, I know it, it will end, and we will be able to, to meet again, uh, maybe not as, as, um, as often as, uh, as before, uh, because it, uh, we, we discovered that we can do uh, feel some problems just by, uh, with a call. Uh, no, I don't see, uh, with respect to the fact we work online, I don't, uh, got, I don't uh, see, I didn't see a lot of differences. Mm. But uh, we need uh, we need more human contact, huh, of course. Huh, as uh, we say, for uh, people doing early stage research uh, like Nozo Farm, to to be more uh, patient centric, to understand what the what are the patient needs. Uh, it it is the same with the consortium. We need to understand the needs of uh, of each other. Yeah, I, I think those sort of softer side conversations that you have when you when you attend meetings or even attend conferences, um, you're lacking that. And, and especially for early career researchers, postdocs, that's their way of, of getting to see what other people are doing, where, where might, might their next career move be to. So quite difficult. We've got another question in the chat, so I'm going to pose that to you now. Um, so given the shifting focus in recent years, how do panel members stay focused and passionate about tackling AMR? So Christoph, do you want to lead off with that one, please? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... I made just already a point, so I just feel the, the, the wind is turning and, and that uh, we have a bit more bright future to see in this area. Um, if poor machine will start at some point, I think the whole the whole market will move and, and the whole ecosystem will move. And this is also why we feel that this is the right moment to start an incubator. Um, so yes, it has been depressive uh, for quite some time and we are still kind of in, in the, the lowest part of the valley, but, but I just feel 
that um, things will, will speed up again. And for that perspective, uh, we are fully committed um, in, in helping to, to um, fill the pipeline from, from, from the base uh, on, on the innovation side and, and hope that this will move uh, at some point to the market. Thank you. Um, Jürgen, how about you? What keeps you um, getting out of bed to work on AMR research? So I think from, from my perspective, um, what I see is the, as I mentioned, this new infrastructure, what we want to establish here, this um, you mentioned this in UK. We have uh, got, we are getting we are, we are getting funding for this Leibniz Center of Photonic uh, in Infection Research, and this is a translational infrastructure, uh, which um, I think um, may lead to a really breakthrough uh, also in AMR diagnostics uh, and also in um, difficult to treat uh, patients because um, with the approach. We are uh, we are establishing there. Uh, we believe that from the proof of concept of a new diagnostic to the prototype, or the proof of concept of a new therapeutic approach to the therapeutic uh, uh, solution, I think we can really shrink down this uh, process, the time which is needed, and um, this um, I think would be very positive. Uh, in order to really make the translation much more effective. And this is what I'm really looking forward uh, establishing this type of research infrastructure. And just one example, for example, here from the therapies, I think um, here we have some new ideas about nanoparticle based therapies where you can efficiently use um, antibiotics, which are still existing and you can put, put them directly to the place where it's needed, yeah? as well as, for example, these new T-cell-based therapies. I think, uh, and here you need also new type of diagnostics, companion diagnostics, and uh, I'm really uh, looking forward uh, of this new type of development. Okay, good, that, that's very helpful. Thank you, Jürgen. Philippe, I'm gonna ask you a slightly different question from the audience, which is um, around investment. Do you see that do you see do you anticipate further investment uh, hesitancy from the investment community or because of covid or do you see it as, as an opportunity and, and perhaps will in allow further investment because of of the novelty and the innovation that's coming through from covid 19 therapeutics it's a really tough question actually uh, how to say no i think uh, i hope there will be more uh, investment in uh, infectious disease and i think so uh, I do not. I don't know if uh, what I fear is that there, there is some over in, uh, investment for uh, viral diseases and not for and that we forget uh, bacterial and uh, fungal diseases. Uh, I think that this uh, this pandemic puts uh, in light that uh, antibiotics. I'm not really uh, fond of the terms of uh, of pandemics or silent pandemics because uh, I think. Uh, we will not have something with bacteria. I hope so. Something not as uh, dramatic as uh, with uh, with COVID. We saw uh, so fast pace uh, global disease. Uh, it was it is impressive not, and not new. Um, I think that uh, what should be said is that um, uh, antibiotics are at the core of uh, support uh, support care, and mainly in uh, intensive care units. But we, we've seen that with uh, COVID, many patients draw. Well, the, the main problems are in the intensive care units. We we have to to make patients avoid to get there. But for instance, in France during the the peak of the crisis uh, in the in the ICU, uh, there were uh, three, three times to uh, two times to three times more beds as usual. So you and uh, with many people that were uh, intubated or with uh, mechanical ventilation, you can uh, imagine the uh, uh, how they were. Uh, um, what should I say? How they uh, they were at risk of uh, contracting a, a bacterial uh, respiratory disease, and with a uh, very few antibiotics for this. So there is a need for this. Still, the the, the need for new antibiotics is uh, is still there, and novel classes I in, insist on. Um, I don't see. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how this. Uh, there was a good news of the uh, the creation of the uh, AMR action fund with all the pharma companies who, uh, who know that there is a problem, but there is a problem of uh, of market as well. So uh, hopefully this, uh, the creation of this fund will, uh, will uh, motivate uh, other uh, um, huge investors to, uh, or VC investors to, uh, to step in again and, uh, and to invest uh, in the field. 
But we, yes. what, what is cru crucial is to, uh, to remember that antibiotics are uh, vital and very important uh, drugs uh, for uh, support, support care in the ICU as any other drugs. And that's uh, uh, where should be the problem for the next, uh, the next pandemic. And, and are we well positioned, is Europe well positioned to develop um, to, to, in the innovation pipeline, the, the full pipeline? Do you think we're well, we're well positioned to be able to um, go ahead or, you know, what's the, what's the long-term perspective? Is it still dim and dismal or is it getting better? I would say, so if you look for the situation right now, it's 80% of the SMEs which are actually holding um, well, they, they hold 80% of the innovation, so I think it's very important to, to help smaller companies or medium, small and medium-sized companies, um, you know, the, to, to develop their products and, and, and uh, fill the, the innovation pipeline. And, um, and, yeah. yeah. And is there anything that, that the research funding community can do to support um, the synergies between companies and things? So we have IMI, hopefully we'll have a similar platform in the future with Horizon Europe? Are there other activities? Definitely hearing from you that, that clinical trials has been a bit of a bottleneck, so, so there's an opportunity there to support AMR research, the development of new diagnostics and therapeutics through better clinical trial platforms. Anything else that's missing in the, in the sort of so, yeah, I just see There's two test values. The one is actually from, from early innovation to whatever proof of principle where, where you need to help startups. And incubators may help there, and the other one is actually early clinical phases where the AMR action plans may help. Um, and uh, I think if they manage to, to see the whole ecosystem, it may actually help to uh, facilitate that, that uh, the, the great innovation which we, which we see uh, to, to move it to the next stage. Okay. Um, I'm looking to see what other questions we have here and how we're doing. I think. I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but Sandra has it popped up, so I guess that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> uh, other questions? I, I would like to, uh, to add uh, with respect to, uh, to clinical trials for SMEs. Uh, one key aspect as well is uh, chemistry, manufacturing, and controls. I mean, the production of the, uh, the experimental uh, drugs we do that are quite significant part of the, uh, the funding we request. And uh, as I mentioned, antibiotics are given at uh, high dose to patients and the gram amount uh, per day. That means that you, you need to produce a high amount of your compounds with the required, uh, required qualities to, uh, to administer it to, to humans. And that's the part that is a uh, very, uh, that is, um, I'd say, it is forgotten uh, in the way the, the we are funded uh, for this. We, we, with the support of uh, uh, structures from Jürgen and Christoph, uh, I'm sure that we can uh, do uh, uh, smarter clinical trials with a smaller patient. I, I don't know if it's in their field, but I think we can do some things there. But uh, one key point as well in GenSpec is the production uh, for the manufacturing of the, uh, of the drugs. And uh, it's once again uh, an issue of market because we we have to, to have an uh, interesting cost of goods uh, with respect to when we want to uh, to out license our, uh, our uh, clinical compounds to, uh, to big pharmas. And this is uh, many cases we, uh, we we cannot afford a, a compound that is too expensive to uh, to produce. But if you want something uh, really innovative you, and really new, you have to invest massively in this uh, this part as well. And this is many times uh, forgotten in the way the uh, uh, the consortium or the, um, the the call for proposal are, are made. So maybe public private partnership investment in manufacturing scale up capability for your right. would be a yeah. useful activity. Yeah, good. Okay, Sandra's here. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for stimulating discussion. Um, I've, I've learned a lot and hopefully the audience has also enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I also can only say thank you to, to everybody uh, who has joined this panel for today and provided some insights on, on their perspectives. And as we were mentioning already, the financing aspect and from our companies uh, and, and their um, views. So then hopefully you will join us tomorrow again for a discussion on the financing and investing uh, topic. We will have Henry Skinner from the AMR Action Fund and hopefully he can provide some news on and updates on their activities. And as Christoph already mentioned, we will see then the official launch of a new incubator in, situated in um, Switzerland and Germany. And yeah, if you want to learn more about this, then join us for tomorrow.
afternoon. So for today, we will uh, yeah, wish you a, a good evening. And uh, yeah, so hopefully see you tomorrow then. Bye for today. So, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>